Uh, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Karina Lipsman, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. I was born in Odessa, Ukraine, which was the former Soviet Union, so for me this mission is very personal. My family immigrated to the United States as refugees to escape life under the Soviet regime and enjoyed the intrinsic freedom and opportunities that this country brings. When I arrived in America, I did not speak English. We lived in low-income housing, on food stamps, and my single mother worked multiple jobs to try to put food on the table and in the evenings attended community college to learn English and advance her career so that she could provide a better future for me. Her sacrifice ignited a fire within me as a child that would lead me to value and never take for granted what we have in this country and what so many outside our shores unfortunately do not have. I became a U.S. citizen by choice. During my swearing-in ceremony, I recited the most meaningful Pledge of Allegiance of my life, and I broke down and cried because I knew how grateful and important this moment was for me and for my future, and how fortunate I was to have my mom sacrifice everything that she knew to give me a better future. But while the Berlin Wall fell, communism did not. Today, one-fifth of humanity still lives under communist tyranny, over 100 years after the Bolshevik Revolution. There is no denying that communism is on the march. North Korea threatens nuclear war and still enslaves 25 million people in a sprawling 21st century gulag. Cuba continues to jail, torture, and murder dissidents who dare to dream of democracy. Vietnam arrests citizens for simply posting messages on social media critical of the party. And China commits genocide in mass re-education camps, separates families, sterilizes minority women, uses forced and child labor, and harvests organs of political prisoners, all while it crushes liberty in Hong Kong, threatens to invade Taiwan, and spies on us at home. This is why the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation exists, to teach the world about the brutal realities of communism, share testimonies from those who lived under its regime and managed to escape, and to shine light on the millions of people currently living under its yoke. As a refugee whose family was forced to make the impossible choices of life in the Soviet Union, I know that communism is not a partisan issue. It is not a matter of left and right. Communism is the human rights issue of our time. This is why I am so honored to stand here before you as we launch the Victims of Communism Caucus to provide a platform in Congress to commemorate the more than 100 million victims of communism around the world and to pursuing the freedom of those still living under totalitarian regimes. And I'd also like to highlight there's two bills currently on the floor that are being voted on. One is the Uyghur Policy Act, and the other is the No Dollars to Uyghur Forced Labor Act. So Congress is already doing wonderful things in terms of highlighting the issues around the world and making sure that we're holding uh, China and other countries with, accountable for their atrocities. And I also want to share some amazing news um, from VOC. Um, our China policy team, uh, Dr. Adrian Zenz, who is in charge of uh, our China policy, has recently been in the news uh, following allegations based on Dr. Zenz's research. Germany's BASF announces full withdrawal from Xinjiang, one of the biggest impacts that VOC has had in its history. And so with that, I would like to introduce and call uh, our founder, uh, Dr. Lee Edwards, to come give his remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, 
Thank you, Karina. On behalf of the Victims of Communism Foundation, so I'm pleased and honored to welcome members from both parties who are with us this afternoon and who are, in fact, the co-chairs of our caucus, Congressman Wesserman Schultz and Congressman Michelle Steele. I'm never quite sure how to say it. Should I say congressmen, congresswomen? <laughs> congresswomen, okay. You know, it's very natural that we're here because the Victims of Communism is a creature of Congress. Um, and indeed, even before we were created some 30 years ago, our predecessor, the National Captive Nations Committee, as a result of its resolution passed unanimously by Congress, every president from Dwight David Eisenhower to Joe Biden has proclaimed the third week of July as National Captive Nations Week. That congressional revolution was approved as a memorial to the victims of communism, passed both the House and the Senate unanimously. And the co-sponsors included, to give you some idea of the breadth of the support, Representative Dana Rohrbacher of California, slightly to the right, and Senator Claiborne Pell, the Democratic Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, who signed us into being, President Bill Clinton. And the major speakers at the dedication of our memorial, just a couple of blocks from here, included President George W. Bush and a great, great, great member of Congress, Tom Lantos, chairman, then chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Recipients of our Truman Reagan Medal of Freedom, including House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer and Senator Jesse Helms, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. From the beginning, as Karina said, from the beginning, we have insisted that partisanship has no place in any discussion of the 100 million people killed by communism and the 1.5 billion people who live today and not by their choice under communism. We welcome everyone here today as we, as those joining us through the mass media, to join our crusade for the freedom of all nations and peoples. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Edwards. And now I'd like to call Ambassador Aldona Bosch. Thank you very much, and th thank you, Congresswoman, and distinguished guests. As a board member of the Victims of Common Memorial Foundation, it is truly my obligation to preserve the history and to educate everyone about the destructive ideology of communism, which devastated my native country of Poland. In World War II, my grandparents, my parents, my entire family, aunts, uncles, everyone, fought to preserve the freedom of their country. They survived the war, but they found themselves, the entire family, in concentration camps. God saved them, but after that, they lived in an imposed communist rule in their native country. My parents left everything, their homeland, their family, their belongings, to emigrate to the United States, the greatest country in the world. For what reason? For the reason to allow my brother and I to live in dignity with the possibility of fulfilling our dreams with our God-given abilities. 
communism. I lived under communism. Communism is a toxic ideology in which rights are trampled, dreams are crushed, and freedom is extinguished. We are too precious as humans to not be allowed to realize our individual potentials. We must all stand together to defend the values of freedom and democracy because those values made our society strong and prosperous and resilient. We must advocate for the freedom of those that still live under totalitarian rule and educate everyone about the lie about the destructive ideology of communism. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Bosch. And now I would like to introduce our co-chair, Representative Congresswoman Michelle Steele. Thank you very much for all coming today. It is so encouraging to see so many people gathered here to mark this renewed effort to remember the victims of communism. Some of may know that my own parents fled from, from communism from North Korea. I'm not here because I'm a first-generation Korean-American I came to this country when I was 19, and I was raised in Japan, so English is my third language. This is the greatest country that we are living. With my accent, I got elected in Congress. I'm so grateful for that. But I heard the stories of brutality firsthand. Fortunately, my both parents fled to South Korea. Now, I'm one of the first Korean-American women ever elected to the Congress of the freest and greatest country in the world. Make no mistake, communism in all its forms is evil. We know this because wherever communism has taken root, poverty, despair, despotism, and death have followed. Communism and its adherents killed over 100 million people in the 20th century alone. This is the hallmark of an evil, evil, evil ideology, and it continues to kill today. Under direction of Xi Jinping, the Chinese Communist Party is conducting mass enslavement and systematic genocide of Uyghurs and other religious, such as Christians and Muslims and ethnic minorities. Kim Jong-un represses North Koreans, forcing them to suffer the indignities of inescapable poverty and hunger while he and his chosen deputies live large and threaten nuclear war. Communist regimes across the world, from Vietnam to Cuba, subject their populations to persistent and horrific suffering. We honor the victims of communism passed by, preventing these evil tyrants from victimizing more people today and in the future. That is part of the work that I'm proud to do as a member of Select Committee on CCP, and I'm a member for Executive Commission on China. That's mostly we work on human rights violations and its bicameral commission. I am committed to ensuring my colleagues in Congress and the, the American people understand that the threat of communism is not just something in the past. One of the most important ways to prevent communism from taking root here in America is to educate our children about its horrors. One of the things I'm most proud of in this House passage of my Deterrent Act, which brings much needed transparency 
accountability, and clarity to foreign gift reporting requirements for colleges and universities across the nation. The Deterrent Act will keep hostile foreign actors, especially communist regime like the CCP, from attempting to buy influence over our future leaders. I'm also working to stop communism infiltration by supporting the crucial Communism Teaching Act, which makes educational materials available through the Victims of Commun Communism Foundation to help educate middle and high school students about the dangers of communism and totalitarianism. This issue is personal to me and to many of my constituents, especially Vietnamese Americans who fled communism, like my parents. I represent Orange County's famous Little Saigon District, which is the home of the largest population Vietnamese anywhere in the world outside of Vietnam itself. Nearly 40% of my constituents are Asian Americans. 16% are Vietnamese Americans. Many of them are first generation as well. For them, the horrors committed by the Vietnamese communists are fresh. They value freedom above all else because they have seen the alternative. Many of their loved ones remain under communist control or have already been killed. So I'm fighting for them. I want to thank you again, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz, for her partnership in leading this caucus. I also want to thank the Victims of Communism Foundation for the years of hard work they have done to create a world free from the false hope of communism. I am honored to be able to extend my work into the half halls of Congress as co-chair of the Victims of Communism Caucus. And I love to work with this foundation to make this world better. And thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm so honored to work with you. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Steele. And now, Congresswoman Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Thank you so much, Karina. I represent a diverse district with many residents who've suffered painful hardships from brutal communist dictators. And so I'm honored to be joined by colleagues, partners, experts, and diplomats to launch, or really to relaunch, the Congressional Victims of Communism Caucus in the 118th Congress and to partner with Michelle Steele to make sure that it is very well understood that fighting communism and standing up for victims of communism is very much a bipartisan issue. I offer my appreciation as such to Congresswoman Steele for her leadership in this bipartisan effort, and I'm proud to serve with her as co-chair of this caucus, one that is dedicated to the countless millions of souls who suffered or perished under communist regimes, and to those who still languish under authoritarian rule to this day. Our aim is to ensure that this caucus will bring justice to the memories of those who've been lost and give voice to those who are still suffering in silence. Beyond raising the profile of these ongoing atrocities, I anticipate the caucus will spur cooperation on key policies to protect human rights and democracy around the world from emerging threats. It is my hope that by highlighting the sheer human cost rendered by, by destructive demagogues, aided by willful blind, willfully blind ideologues, that we can prevent some of the worst tragedies of the 20th century from repeating themselves. Since being authorized unanimously by Congress and enacted by President Clinton, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation has been at the forefront of this crucial work for over three decades. Through research, advocacy, and curation of the Victims of Communism Museum, the foundation has expertly implemented its mission of educating future generations about the history of communist abuses. They were central in uplifting the stories of the 100 million souls who perished at the hands of communism, as well as the over one billion who continue to lack the political freedoms and individual rights that are held sacred by those who value liberty. 
I'm grateful to have the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation as a partner and a collaborator in this effort and for their support for this launch event. This mission is also personal for me. As a proud Jewish American, I'm deeply attentive to the disproportionate impact of communist despotism on religious minorities and other marginalized groups. That includes the impact that it had on my own family, the reason that I'm here today. My great-grandparents fled to America from Eastern Europe in the wake of the Russian communist revolution that produced the Soviet Union. Karina, my my great-grandparents on my father's side fled what was then Russia and lived in Odessa. And generations later, it is clear, as your family experienced, that, uh, that that oppression still occurs, thankfully not in the Ukraine of today, but we know that Russia very much intends to run over Ukraine and oppress yet another generation of an entire nation's people. While then, Bolshevik agitators made rich promises of equality, coexistence, and utopia, their ascent to ultimate power only resulted in harsh crackdowns on all religious adherents with a special emphasis on torturing Jews. The arms of the Soviet state picked up where the Tsar left off, accelerating and inciting anti-Jewish pogroms, massacres, and forced displacement. During World War II, Stalin's Red Army initially locked arms with Hitler, turning the other cheek while the Nazis converted Poland, where the other side of my father's family came from, into a mass grave for millions of Jews, Slavs, Poles, Roma, and others. Later, the so-called Soviet liberation resulted in countless atrocities, including the Red Red Army's indiscriminate murder of Jews while attempting to ambush their Nazi captors. There's no question that my great-grandparents' decision to seek refuge in the United States was a matter of life and death, And Michelle, I agree wholeheartedly with you when you say that the United States is the greatest country on planet Earth because only in America could two generations later, after Michelle's parents fled North Korea, could a United States congresswoman whose family originated from North Korea's communism could end up as a member of Congress. And only in America two generations after my family, a nice Jewish girl's family, (laughs) fled uh, not just Russia, but also Poland. Uh, In my case, my great-grandfather left after a a Polish military leader slapped him in the face. Uh, He was not even in the military, and uh, and that was it for him. Uh, It didn't take any more provocation for him to come to America, and the next year, followed by my great-grandmother, my grandmother and her three sisters. So I'm eternally grateful that because of their strength and determination, I grew up in a place where I can speak freely and be whatever I want to be in line with my beliefs and Jewish values. In turn, these values, like tikkun olam, which is Jews' responsibility to repair the world, lie at the center of my work in Congress, this obligation to leave the world better than you found it to help those who cannot help themselves, drove me to, pu- to pursue public service and motivates my ongoing work on behalf of victims of communism and all forms of tyranny. In my own district in Broward County, Florida, I'm proud to represent a diverse, vibrant diaspora community that contributes to these efforts. Many of them, many of my constituents, have firsthand experience living under communist regimes like Cuba, where millions have endured totalitarian rule and gut-wrenching violations of human rights just 90 miles from my home state. I've listened to countless horrific stories from my Cuban friends and neighbors and promised to use my platform and have done so to ensure that all Americans hear the truth about communism and its brutal and horrifying impact on so many innocent lives. As co-chair of the Cuba Democracy Caucus for the past several years, I work with bipartisan colleagues to fully fund global democracy programs, promote accountability for human rights abuses, and rally support for Cuban pro-democracy activists who bravely mobilized on July 11th, 2021. Since then, I've been proud to lead efforts to secure the release of Cuban political prisoners like Michael Castillo Perez and Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara, who sacrificed their freedom in defense of Patria Vida, fatherland and life. I'm inspired by their bravery and determined to ensure that the United States Congress lives up to our moral obligation to counter communism and deliver hope and democracy to those who need it most. 
There is so much more that we must do, and even greater challenges on the horizon as China expands its malign influence into Europe and the Western Hemisphere, as Michelle expounded upon, to disrupt and undermine the liberal rules-based order. And I hope that my Democratic and Republican colleagues will join Congresswoman Steele and me to meet this moment and these challenges. And I'm confident that the victims of Commun Communism Caucus, as well as the Foundation, can and will serve as a home base for this generational struggle against oppression. Thank you again for having me. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. And now I would like to invite one of our witnesses, Noor Iman. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Congresswoman, all of you. Um, my name is Nur Iman Abdurashid, and I was raised and born in Kashgar. It's under CCP. So today, um, I'm testifying for my family. They are in Chinese prison since 2017. I have not heard from my family since June 18, 2017, and as they are illegally incarcerated in Chinese prisons. My father, every time I talk about my family, I don't, I can't stop crying, but this time I'll try not to stop, not to cry. Um, I just wanted to show you my father's face. Abdurish Tohti um, was a self-employed businessman. According to Chinese embassy staff member in Turkey, Ankara, he was sentenced to 16 years and 11 months in prison on December 13, 2017. According to an official document, he was transferred to Gamlik prison. My mother, Tajigal Qadir, she was a housewife. According to Chinese embassy staff member, she was also sentenced to 13 years to prison. On December 13, 2017, same day with my, with my dad. And my younger brother, Amajan Abdurish, became a mechanic after finishing middle school, uh, starting his own repair shop when he was 18. Later, he had three children. He was originally arrested in March um, 2016 and was sentenced to seven years in prison in October 2016. My younger brother, my youngest brother, Mehmet Ali Abdurshid, owned a car repair shop with my younger brother in, in Kashgar, where the two would repair um, and maintain luxury cars. He is married and is a father of two. According to Chinese embassy officials in Ankara, Mehmet Ali was sentenced to 15 years and 11 months in prison on August 20, 2017. According to leaked document, my brother currently serving time in Bingtuan Taman prison. It's likely that he is subject to forced labor at, at that prison. I spoke to Dr. Adrian Zenz after the Xinjiang police file has leaked. He confirmed that my whole family, my mom, my dad, and a two brother, was detained in 2017. August 2021, ITV journalist Debbie Edward went to my home in Kashgar. According to her report, the house I grew up was empty, demolished, became a ghost place. Seeing the place where I grew up in this um, horrific uh, state has further encouraged me to keep fighting fighting for my family. If a house made of bricks can turn into a state of rubble in a, just a few years, then how about my mom and my dad? I would like the U.S. government to use its power to get at least news of my family and, as, and to work for their release from illegal incarceration. I need to know they're alive. So a proof of life would also go a long way because I'm not 100% sure they are even on the surface of the earth anymore. 
I hope, um, and thank you for listening, and I hope some action take, uh, will be taken in, in, in this month, in a few years, uh, before it's too late. And I want to see my mom and my dad in, alive in this world um, before I die. Thank you. Thank you, Noor, for sharing that powerful story with us. And our last witness is Marita McCormick. Thank you. Well, after that, I'm, I'm shaken. So, um, honorable representatives, um, it's, it's a great honor to be here, Dr. Edwards, Ambassador, and everybody. Um, I don't know where to start, and uh, this is um, an emotional day, but it, it's also a, a beautiful, um, wonderful opportunity, and God has a sense of humor because I hadn't read the email and I wasn't prepared, so to say, so this is coming an impromptu from my heart. And um, I just wanted to say, uh, blessed uh, land to everybody, because if you see, I have a little mark there on my uh, forehead, and to everybody who is of different religious, uh, happy feast days of, of your religion. And I'm saying that because just for saying that, in my country, I was born and raised in Albania, uh, you would get imprisoned. Um, religion was declared a crime. In 1967, Albania was uh, declared the first atheist country in the world. And if you mentioned, if you exercised religion or if you mentioned anything that had to do with religion, you were basically done. We were told in our public schools, the only options that we had in our country, that um, if you hear anybody mention the word God, just tell us. And I felt this conflict inside me because I didn't want to spy on my grandmother because she was, you know, time after time, she will invoke the name of God. And um, I grew up basically in, in a very loving family. Outside of our homes, we had a beautiful uh, life because I had I have great parents and I had great grandparents and uncles and cousins because we were very close knit families, but outside of those walls it was a total different life. We uh, my grandfather from my mother's side was declared a kulak in 1948, and my grandfather from my father's side was declared a reactionary uh, a little bit later because he basically refused communism uh, as an ideology. And what that meant, that meant that by law, we, I was a third generation, we were not allowed to move, we were not allowed to get an education, we were not allowed to get um, jobs that we wanted, we basically were not allowed to pursue our vocations. And that's how I grew up. I didn't know anything else, I didn't know anything better, I only knew the love that my family gave me. But as a six years old girl uh, that I was curious, I was doing great at school, I felt, you know, I remember, I, I, I remember that somebody asked me, what is the first moment that you remember that it was communism, it wasn't right? And I said, I think I was six when they start creating those ranks of Fatosa pioneers and then the communist youth and then you, if you are good enough and you have it right with the party, you will become a communist member. But I wasn't one of those, so I could not progress that way. But we were little children, and we were not allowed to participate in social activities that our school um, uh, was having. And a little bit later, I was in middle school, and I thought I had a passion for a certain vocation, and I wanted to do it, and I went for it. And I won. I was number four in the list to get in a certain vocational middle school. And as I was getting ready to go, the whole family pulled me apart and the, pulled me aside, and they were telling me that I couldn't go because of the political biography, because we were not communist enough. And I don't know how my parents tried to balance, uh, to love me and to comfort me, and to not allow me to hate these people. Because as a 12-year-old girl, what do you do? You are a teenager, you, you have all those dreams, and all those dreams are crushed. But I also grew up uh, with other people in our house. 
Our house was taken by the communist government because it was big, it was wonderful, voluminous, and could host other people. So I thought they were all my uncles and my aunts. In fact, they were all um, employees of the state that were working and that were staying for free in our house because um, the communist party said that we should do that. While my mom's house was totally taken, it was a big estate. It was changed into a government depot, a blacksmith place, whatever you name it. So I grew up um, with knowing that that used to belong to my grandfather, but not anymore. My mother and her youngest siblings and her mother and aunt were put in a house of another kulak that was hung in the middle of the village while her brothers were put to forced labor camps in the north of Albania because that's how they would do, they would switch uh, uh, places. So I grew up with that, no schooling, no education, restriction. We were not allowed to speak well of the United States and we were not allowed to speak well of other uh, Western countries. But we were um, told to um, embrace communism and everything, when I say everything, uh, every textbook, Every um, conversation, every literary work, every musical, every art piece that was created, it had to reflect the ideology of communism. And that was uh, something that we thought it was right, but we still felt the contradiction because the natural law does it work. Uh, so we grew up through that, and um, I think the domino effect still continues. I am the only person that is educated from my family. Um, from my uh, uh, entire family. And I hear, uh, I'm here on behalf of the whole nation of Albania because such a small country, we have not told our story. And we have 38 martyrs of faith that were blessed by, uh, were um, beatified by Pope Francis a um, few years ago. And we have so much to share and so much to uh, to tell so things cannot be repeated. So uh, while I tell my story and when I congratulate the uh, Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation and where I applaud this um, initiative for the caucus, I want to say what I told uh, Dr. Spalding a few days ago. They had an event for uh, Gulag's Archipelago and listening to those scholars and listening to those people, I said, I have hope because this is the only country in the world that pays attention to such things. And please continue to do so, and please do something to make sure that the history doesn't repeat itself, because it doesn't stop with the third generation. I'll tell you, uh, the f domino effect continues forever. Thank you, I'm sorry. For taking so long. Thank you so much, Marita, and thank you all so much for being here. We are delighted to uh, launch the Victims of Communism Caucus. Uh, we're excited for all the work that we're going to be doing here and the impact as, impacts that we're going to make. Um, and I would like to invite those of you who have never been to the museum to come visit us. Uh, we are two blocks from the White House off McPherson Square. It's an easy metro ride, I promise. Um, come visit the museum. Take a look for yourself. We have wonderful exhibits. And uh, with that, I just want to thank you all again for coming. Uh, media who would like uh, to uh, come to the stage and, or come by the stage on this side uh, for interviews with um, the Congresswomen, um, please feel free to do so. Uh, everyone else, we will meet you outside in the atrium for snacks and drinks and networking. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>